And welcome back to the Hood Rat Podcast, where I'm Hood Rat, you're Hood Rat, and what? We are Hood Rats, and um, I, have a, I have a big show for you guys today. I'm very excited. I know uh, my my uh, my teal, my comic teal, uh, Pass Point Comics. That's Efren, who's going to be doing this interview with me. Is very excited. We have a uh, one of my favorite writers right now, currently. Like I read all his uh, books that come out. Um, I buy his comics and I buy his trades because I I actually want to. I actually love reading his trades, and my son loves it too. So I have. All, uh, all the trades for uh, Killadelphia. Um, I know those are fourth volume out. I haven't gotten that yet. And um, I just got done reading Nidia Hall's uh, Nightmare blog. Um, and this writer, man, you wouldn't even believe, man. He's He's been in Hollywood for over 30 years. He's done, he's not only just a comic book writer, uh, comic book writer, he's been in Hollywood for a while. He's been producing and writing. He's done TV shows such as um, The Adult Swim's uh, The Boondocks, where you want a Peabody. He's done the Hulu's uh, Wu-Tang, an American saga. He's written for Everybody Loves Chris, um, America Gods, America Gods. um, And uh, he's written for Def Comedy Jam, uh, The Runaways. And also, I think he wrote uh, he wrote for the Oscars as well when uh, Chris Rock was on there. Um, He does films such as Blade. He worked on Blade. He's like, you know, I'm a big Blade fan. He's also done Rush Hour. Some of the comic books he's written are uh, Falcon, um, Lando, Star Wars, Star Wars, guys. Lando's Double or Nothing, The Mandalorian, The Star Wars uh, Bounty Hunters, a one-shot um, with IG-88. Uh, he's also, like I said, he's written for uh, Philadelphia um, and Nita Hall's uh, Nightmare Blog and also James Bond. And not only has he won a Peabody, but he also won a uh, NAACP uh, Image Award also. Um, and I want to... Uh, I want to bring up to the stage, and this is Mr. Rodney Barnes. Mr. Barnes, welcome, welcome, Mr. Barnes. And I want to introduce you to my uh, my cohort cohort right here. This is uh, Efren, Mr. Uh, Efren Past Point One. Um, and welcome, welcome to the uh, podcast. How are you doing today? Doing okay. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a uh, um, it's a uh, it's a big day for both of us. We're uh, really uh, big fans of yours, um, and we want to start off with um, with just a couple questions to get the conversation started. This is what we call the hot seat. Um, I love uh, Nita Haas and the Philadelphia. Is that, is the universe going to expand? Yeah, it already has. Uh, on Substack, we have um, three other stories. We have the ongoing Elysium Garden story that was in the back of Philadelphia. We have 20 Degrees Past Rigor, which is a zombie series that's set in Flint, Michigan. Um, and we have uh, Johnny Gatlin, who is a, a gunfighter in hell. But all of those books are sort of connected to the Philadelphia universe in one way or another. That was my second question. Substack, exactly what is that? Is that it's online, correct? Yes, yeah, a subscription-based um, uh, uh, setup where you can subscribe to get your books digitally, like uh, Comicsology or something like that, where um, you can get these books um, on a regular basis. Cool. And newsletters from me and other stuff, yeah. things that are going on in my career and different things, if you like what I do. Oh, I do. Oh. <laughs> we <you>. all do. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we love what you do, Mr. Barnes. Um, simple question for me. What is your all-time, all-time favorite sports team, regardless of sport? Wow. Uh, team? Oh, man. You're going to make people hate me. Probably Dallas Cowboys. Oh, probably. Dallas. Yeah, hey, no one's probably. hating the Dallas. No one's hating oh, Dallas. Oh, there's the people who hate the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> my, my little brother hates the uh, Dallas Cowboys. So, yeah. Oh, I remember in the 90s, man, when they were winning everything. That's there that's the Cowboys I know, man. You know, Emerson 92 Smith, to 95. Man. There you yeah, go. man. They, they, yeah. they were they were squad. My second, uh, my second uh, question for you is, uh, if you had a choice to bring one person to dinner, living or alive, or dead or alive, dead or alive, who would it be and where would you take them? That's a tough question because there's so many people. Um, I got to spend some time with Stephen King. I would probably spend more time with Stephen King. Um, I enjoyed the conversation we had. Um, I'm an author's guy. So, you know, folks like James Baldwin, um, writers, you know, mostly writers, Um 
you know, it's funny because I've met a lot of my heroes, but probably somebody from the past who would be a writer. Uh, take them to Delmonico's. They can sit in that green booth and um, we'd have a great conversation. The famous green booth, man. I see that green booth all the time on your uh, on your Instagram. Um, yep. What? Let me ask you one more question because I think it's pretty interesting, and, I, and I've and I've uh, read some of your interviews before. Like, what conversations did you have with uh, Stephen King? Because he was one of my favorite authors growing up. Yeah, um, I was Michael Clark Duncan standing on the movie The Green Mile, so he came oh, wow. to set one day to visit, and talked a little bit because he was moving around but i was following him like a stalker but uh talked about writing talked about little things here and there but mostly about him and his work and how much i love everything that he does man that's uh, that's awesome and uh I, I don't think any uh people realize how tall you are you're like six eight right you're six eight six seven six eight yeah six Somebody seven six eight yeah. yeah and i want to tell you my origin how i met rodney um is that i ran down from a panel remember that Efren? Yeah. I ran down from her panel like uh, huffing and puffing. I had like five minutes to get to you at the image booth at San Diego Comic Con, and I was there, and you were sitting there, and you were so nice, man. I was like, uh, oh, I'm trying. You're, you're awesome, man. Like I was like, I was huffing, puffing, and sweating, and I'm like getting my books out of my bag. Mr. Barnes, man, I, I love your books. I love Mandalorian. I love like uh, Philadelphia. Like, can you please sign them? You're like, hey, man, calm. it's all good, bro. Let's let's end chill, man. And I I really appreciate uh, that about you. Yeah, I appreciate but, you reading the stuff. Oh man, your book, your your stuff is awesome. But um, as a fan, I would like to ask you, like, uh, what are some of your origins, Mr. Barnes? Like, what what did you start like uh, as a writer, and then how did you end up in Hollywood and comics? Like, how did that happen? Um, you know, I'm from Annapolis, Maryland, and um, you know, for me, I would have to say, as an I'm an only child, even though I have a lot of. Um, brother siblings from you know different dynamics half brother sisters that type of thing so i grew up a lot i spent a lot of time by myself reading my mother was a school teacher so it was always books around so i read a lot i had no idea that a lot of this was the building the foundation for me being a writer sort of expanding on my imagination um a lot of television a lot of films a lot of just i'm a junkie of 70s movies love them 70s 80s movies and um that was sort of where my foundation was born back home and then when i went to howard university i started to work as a production assistant on movies that came to the area um the dc maryland area like um the pelican brief quiz show major league two um forrest gump um bunch of movies and eventually ended up working on a movie major pain with damon wayans and wow. um he took an interest in me and helped me out a lot and uh gave me a couple of jobs around the country working with him and then i worked on a movie bulletproof with adam sandler uh, i'm actually in that movie for a scene and um eventually moved out lived in my car and um, started to work as a production assistant in la um slowly but surely started making enough money to get an apartment and um eventually worked on a got my opportunity as a writer on damon show my wife and kids and that started with other shows uh, that led to other shows and so i worked on a show runaways uh for marvel mm -hmm. and they liked what i was doing and i sort of seized an opportunity that uh if they could reach out to marvel publishing and let them know that I'd like an opportunity to write comics. Um, I'd really appreciate it. And they gave me an opportunity, Marvel Publishing did, to write the book Falcon. And that was the first book I'd ever read, uh, written. And I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't really understand the relationship between um, words and art. You know, I understood it with television and film, but not so much um, how to work with an artist uh, would be really wordy. And you know, when I look at it now, it's like, I wish I hadn't have done this. I wish I hadn't have done that. But I sort of, uh, it opened the door up to do other things and, you know, other opportunities came slowly but surely after that. And I'm um, still doing it to this day. Hmm. How was it living out of your car in LA, man? It actually wasn't bad. I mean, I was so close to um, what I wanted to do that, it, was, it wasn't as bad. I don't think I could do it today. It's a different world. I mean, that was 1994, you know, mm -hmm. so it was a completely different world. I mean, I, when I say I lived out of my car, it was like I would work 
during the day on one movie, maybe sometimes two, I would go from one set to another. And then I had a garbage business where I would um, get a dollar fifty a bag to clean up after the caterers and craft service folks and mm -hmm. find a, uh, a garbage bin to dump the stuff in and made enough money to survive. But I was working, you know, 20 hours a day at the mm -hmm. very least. And I catch some sleep when I could. But I was close to what I wanted to do. I was working on movies. Mm -hmm. Even if it was at that level, I was still in the business. So I never really looked at it as, oh man, I'm homeless. You know, I looked mm -hmm. at it as I'm working towards something. So. And you went to Howard, right? Is that what I you did. Went? I went to yeah, Howard. I went to a bunch of colleges, but Howard was the last. What, what did you major in? Uh, communications, radio, communications? TV, and film. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, man. So did you have a, I mean, I, I know you were chasing your dreams. That's, this was like the 90s, right? Around the 90s, early 90s. Early 90s. 90s. Yeah, early yeah, 90s. Yeah, early 90s. There was, just, there was some good times, man. I know you were chasing your dreams. And uh, did you have a backup plan just in case, man? Was there a backup no, plan? No, I, I think I wore out my backup plan in the beginning. <laughs> um, I left, uh, I spent a bunch of time after getting out of high school uh, chasing the idea of being an athlete, although I never had any reason other than the fact that I was big. Uh, to think that one day I was going to be able to do anything athletically for money. But mm -hmm. I think a lot of it was trying to sort of figure out what I wanted to do. I was kind of lost. I didn't really have a plan after high school. Mm -hmm. So I sort of wandered a bit. And then um, circumstances sort of led to um, taking a shot because there was no plan B. Mm -hmm. that, that hustle still seems like it, li it lives within you because yeah. I know that I see you you write so much like you're writing you know Philadelphia you're you're creating the whole Philadelphia universe plus you're writing for winning time in HBO and I know that success off you know the off HBO is going to turn into some another success because that was a big show for me I think for Efren cuz Efren grew up in that era too right Ef? Oh yeah yep see Magic Johnson Kareem yeah I was a child of the 70s <laughs> There you go so, yeah. How does that, how does that uh I mean are you how do you do it? How do you how do you keep how do you um, keep up? I really just keep going. I mean, I think um, when I got my first opportunity on my wife and kids, you know, I never looked at. There's this weird thing with jobs in Hollywood; they only last for a certain amount of time, even the best of jobs. So, when you come from conventional thinking, usually when you get a job, or back when I was coming up, you watch your parents. Like my mother was a teacher for 35, 40 years. And you get a job and until you retire from that job, that's your job, unless you go to another job. Mm -hmm. But it's usually, unless you get fired, it's your choice to go from one place mm -hmm. to another. In Hollywood, very rarely does a show last more than a couple of seasons. Um, you can get lucky and get a show that lasts a long time, but I didn't want to depend on that luck. So mm -hmm. even when I have a job, Damon used to have this saying, work begets work. I was always still looking at something else. I was developing other things. I was working on rewrites on movies, um, always looking for new revenue streams. Um, and because I'm in a business where I'm sort of a, an entrepreneur, I'm an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. So um, I eat what I kill and mm -hmm. I have to be able to have enough revenue streams in order to, you know, take care of my kids and make sure everything's okay. So I always, created other revenue streams whether it was working on award shows whether it was working in commercials um theater um speech writing uh, working for various comedians um things other than television and film you know I've, i was always looking for ancillary forms of uh revenue yeah it looks like you've um i mean you've mastered kind of every genre you did um comedy you did drama you did. Uh, you've done history that we've seen here with, uh, you know, with Philadelphia. Um, you've done. Um, I mean, you've done it all. You know, you've done it all. Like uh, you've done sort of like a, uh, you know, um, you know, like history with uh, with winning with uh, winning times, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, like. Uh, so let's talk more about like what you what your filmography, okay? So because uh, I'm a big fan of Blade, <laughs> you know, yeah. like uh, if you, I, I just am. Um, how did that come about, Lincoln? How was it working with uh, Wesley Snipes and that crew? Uh, they were great. Um, Blade was the first job I had as a California resident. Um, like that was literally, I was living in my car and um, a good friend called and said, hey, 
got this uh, film shooting start Monday. Do you want a job? And I said, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the first, that was the first gig, but Wesley was great. Steve Norrington, a director, um, everybody involved. It was a great experience and gave me an opportunity to sort of learn LA because when you mm -hmm. come from another place, LA's, you know, my hometown is more like a grid and I know how to get from one place to another here, mm -hmm. LA, you know, it's, you could, I still wander into communities and don't know how to get out. So, you know, it was a great opportunity to sort of get the lay of the land. When you worked on Blade, did you read the comic books previously or to, you know, to get some history of the character? Um, not as much. Um, I knew who Blade was and I knew Blade uh, because of Dracula and uh, Tomb of Dracula. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know Blade. I didn't know Blade as well as I knew some other characters. So for the new Blade movie that's in production, has anybody reached out to you for that? No, no, oh, no, no. I think they should. <laughs> that would be fun, but no, yeah. they haven't. Yeah. Yeah, you are becoming the masters of uh, vampires right now, you know, like, uh, with the Philadelphia <laughs> stuff. Yeah. You know? I appreciate that. From your lips to God's ears, I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> and how was it working with like Chris Rock on his show? Uh, Chris is great. Uh, love Chris to death. Um, and, you know, everybody involved. Um, still a relationship that I maintain to this day or that we've maintained till this day. Um, Chris is an incredible guy, incredible friend. Love him to death. Mm -hmm. And how how many seasons did that go? Four. Four. Four That's seasons. not bad, right? For for Hollywood. No, right? not That's at all. Good. That's not at all. Good. It was a good run. We had a really good run. Yeah, and um, how about um, Boondocks? Let's talk about Boondocks because you want a Peabody for them. And I I, uh, I I listened to an interview and you said like uh, you had a lot of freedom writing for Adult Swim rather than like the network television, right? Yeah, I mean, cable television in general is different than network television. Um, the boundaries are different. And this is before social media and all of that. So, you know, you could profanity, you know, you could do certain things and say certain things and push certain boundaries. And um, it was just a completely different experience than the one that I'd known up until. Yeah, and cable television is more like ABC, NBC, CBS, right? And then network television is kind of... No, like network, the this other way around. Uh, network around, television okay. is ABC, NBC, Fox, CBS. Um, cable television, or premium cables like HBO, Showtime, um, those. And then you have your streamers, like Netflix and Hulu and, um, you know, that type of thing. Okay, and uh, how about, how about uh, so moving over to streaming, right? Hulu. Um, you worked on the uh, Wu Tang and American Saga, right? Like, how was that, man? Did you get to meet the crew? Uh, well, Rizza was in the writers' room every day, and um, you know he was a great guy. You know, I went to Staten Island for a few months, uh, taping a couple of episodes, and wrote a epi couple of I don't know one or two episodes, and um, just all around great folks, uh, great people. Really, really love working on that show. Um, great experience all the way around. How did you gain knowledge to write Wu Tang Clang? I mean, did we did research. Oh, Same did. thing as with Winning Time. Um, mm -hmm. Hear a lot of stories, read a bunch of stuff. Riz has written um, a couple of books, and he was in the room every day. And you know, when you're writing a series like that, that's sort of like a, a period piece, but a soap opera nonetheless. You know, the relationships between the characters. It really is about mapping out and. Um, charting a course and Alex Z who ran that show great guy great leader um enjoy working with him as well and um just overall great experience I was hoping there'd be a third season <laughs> I think there is a third season I think they just really? finished uh wrapping up oh one. really yeah. oh wow nice so what did what did you learn man uh because I know you've been in Hollywood for a while and then you mm -hmm. you got to uh kind of like examine the uh record industry like mm -hmm. uh how was that like how is there a di is there a difference between hollywood and the record industry or is no, it a whole nother I, thing i you know? think entertainment in general i mean i worked on another show vinyl um the season two of vinyl and um you know you learn that entertainment is entertainment you know a lot of the similar personalities with um music acts and actors and you know it's a it's a fast-paced high octane profession and um you just have to have your head on straight and uh, hope for the best. Mm -hmm. When there's a new series that's starting up, like um, the the Lakers one or Wu Tang, how does do how do people reach you, or do you reach them? Do you, do you hear about a, a script that you go out to them, or do they come to you? 
Uh, it's different in every case, but I do have representatives. I have um, an agency and I have a manager and I have an attorney and the whole team of folks who sort of um, lobby on my behalf. But more often than not, because I've been around for a while, folks reach out to me if they're interested yeah. in what I do, if they feel like, you know, it'd be, I would be a good fit for what they do if if I'm doing that. But I'm constantly, it's a, a, a juggling act between me creating things on my own that I'm looking to sell to the marketplace and other folks who have created things that are looking for a guy like me to be a part of what they do. So it's a duality to it. All right. So that, that kind of segues us into the next, my next question and mm -hmm. our next subject. Like, uh, how did this come to be, man? Because this, <laughs> this, I mean, when I saw this, you didn't even have to sell it to me. I was going to watch it. You know, mm -hmm. like, uh, it's just like, uh, I was going to watch the first episode for sure. Um, yeah, John C. Riley. <laughs> you know, like, I was like, yo, man, that's, that's, that's a good bus right there. You know, like, how yeah. did, so can you walk us through how it all happened? Like us, like, you know, normal people that just read comics and watch TV, you know, like, how does it happen? Yeah, so, um... One of our executive producers, uh, Jim Hecht, uh, read a book by Jeff Perlman called um, uh, Showtime. And um, it was, uh, he was very moved. He was a huge Lakers fan, still is. And he went to Jeff Perlman and got the rights to that book. And then he got that book to Adam McKay, who, was, who is a huge basketball fan as well. And uh, he had a deal at HBO and he took it to HBO and HBO was willing to put it in development. Then they hired Max Borenstein, who uh, is partnered with me on a bunch of stuff and one of my best friends. And he reached out to me and said, hey, would you like to jump on this with me and um, go on this journey? And I said, yeah. And we started working together and HBO then finally greenlit the show and we were off to the races. Wow, that's awesome. Like, uh, I mean, how how did you guys find so much great um, talent? Because uh Quincy Isaiah, like that mm -hmm. played Magic Johnson. Mm -hmm. I that guy was he's so perfect for the role. I was like the smile, the positivity, the gleam in his eyes, like the mm -hmm. um even just the the honesty of of being innocent, you know, like mm -hmm. uh you know, I mean, did you guys did you guys bring Magic Johnson in to like <laughs> help cast him because he's no. so perfect? No, none of the original Lakers uh were involved. Rick Fox was our uh consultant on the show but um no quincy was cast quincy went through francine Maisler, our uh, great casting director she found a lot of those folks and um brought them in quincy was sort of unique in that he was the first because he didn't have a show without a uh, magic johnson and um quincy's from michigan um like magic and understands the cadence of how folks speak and the culture of how folks live and quincy was a football player he had to lose a bunch of weight to become a basketball player and learn the game of basketball in a way that he could mimic um, some of the moves of magic. And um, great guy. Love Quincy. Love Quincy. The, to death. the smile, man. The smile. Yeah. Right, F? That, that's oh, yeah. that magic that's smile. Magic like, smile. Yep. Where yep. You can it never be mad at you can never be mad at magic with that smile man <laughs> that smile you know on uh you know across uh even with these uh you know beating my uh our, me and Efren are from uh the bay area so we're mm. big golden state fans we even yeah. when he, he they're smashing us we can't be mad at magic yeah, he's he's, so. you know like it's just he it's a magic thing let's talk about i want to ask you questions about jerry west man because uh <laughs> you know i think jason clark played jerry west and i t I, I told we talked about him a little bit in in san diego comic con when i met you he's my favorite character in the whole thing because he's the heart he's mm -hmm. the heart the passion the love of for basketball and for the team and then i see these things by jerry west like that's not me like well you know like i was like but bro like i love you even more now you helped us warriors win a championship and right. then i got to see you as a young passionate person like i can see that love that you bring to basketball like mm -hmm. um tell us a little bit more about like how you uh you know how you, how you create this the uh the jerry west character for for a well, time. I think all of the characters, you know, we went through research, you know, read a bunch of books, read a bunch of articles, um, you know, all of the stuff that's known to the public or that's been put out, you know, to for the public to consume. We did research on and sort of that research was the foundation by which we based a lot of our work on. Mm -hmm. I like the uh, Larry Bird character. Excuse me, I don't know the mm -hmm. actor's name, but he's mm -hmm. that seems to me like Larry yeah. Bird. That, Larry Bird to you know, and just angry, yeah. you know. 
<laughs> yeah, I think intense is probably more the word. Uh, yeah. To be as great as him and a bunch of those guys are, it really takes, you know, you can't be, you know, even with Magic with um, that great smile, you know, under it, there's probably from a sports perspective, a killer, you know, somebody yeah. who really, any of those guys, you think any of the greats, Muhammad Ali, you know, whoever that's operating in, uh, on a really, really iconic level, um, at the heart, they have to be super competitive, you know, so... Uh, whether they're sullen, whether they have a lot of charisma or whatever, someplace in between is really a high-level sportsman. Yep. And and Adrian Brody uh, played Pat Riley. I, that's mm -hmm. a fascinating story there. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I mean I think I was like when they were winning all those cha championships. I think I was maybe two or three. So I seen all these things on reruns, you know, like on reruns with the you know Laker the Laker great champions and you know during the Jordan and, and Bird era. Um, yeah, are we going to see more? Are we going to see the development of Pat Riley through the next next season? Yeah, we will definitely. Um, you know, we uh, we're writing season two right now, and Pat Riley is prominent a prominent character in season two. Hey, congratulations on the season two as well! Yeah, thank um, you very much. Thank you. And the Red Arbach, Red Arbach, it was played by Michael Chiklis. Man, mm -hmm. what a perfect, <laughs> what a perfect Arbach. Yeah. And how? And let me ask you a question, like. Like um, the Celtics, man, the Celtics, just like the the Celtics, like mm -hmm. the way you frame the Celtics. I think I think all of us can agree on that. You know, yes. like the, the Celtics. So tell me, like, tell me more about that. How did you guys frame it? You framed it so well about the well, Celtics. That I think you, you know, we probably we framed it from the perspective of a Laker fan. You know, it's like um, the show is you know, a Laker centric show. So obviously if you're going to have a uh, Batman, you're going to have the Joker, you know? So you, <laughs> if you're a Batman fan, you're going to look at the Joker as not necessarily the nicest of guys. So I think, you know, that's the way I would take how we presented the idea of the Celtics still with respect. I'm sure that Batman respects the Joker more so than, you know, the Riddler or Grodd or some of those other characters. But, um, you know, with every, with every, protagonist you have an antagonist and um in our world it's the boston celtics one scene uh, during the series that stuck in my head because i used to watch the you know lakers and celtics play back in back in the day in the boston garden mm -hmm. i remember watching on abc and it was so dark and dank in there even they talked about the floors being loose and everything else and mm -hmm. you guys in the in the show it was portrayed perfectly it reminded me of those days yes yeah, I mean, we were able, great set design folks um, that have done a great job um, recreating the Forum and uh, the Boston Garden and all of our arenas. Um, they do an incredible job just making it look like it was of that period, that time. Yep. And I, I have some friends from Boston and I call them uh, during this series. I was like, is... Do you, are, are they portraying you guys right, man? Because it seems like it's, it, it seems, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't seem like a Boston cat would agree with that. And he's like, bro, that's Boston. That's just, that's the garden. That's the garden. Even, and, and he, and he's an Irish, Irish dude born in Boston, man, in, in that area, you know, like, and yeah. he, he agrees with it, man. Um, and how about this, man? How about Maurice? Tell me. Yes. About, tell me about Maurice, man. That's the most important actor in the series. Um, <laughs> Maurice is the glue. Um, <laughs> uh, how that started was um, early on in the process, um, Max and I and uh, Jim Hecht and Rebecca Bertucci, we would meet on the weekends and we would start to, as we were talking about what the show would be and really plotting everything out. And one day I walk into um, our writer's room and I see a picture of all the actors and I see my picture up there and I'm like, why is my picture up there? <laughs> it's like, oh, this character, you know, the security guy, you should play the security guy. And I was like, yeah, whatever. You know, it was supposed to be one line and a joke because I'm that guy, you know. And then I started to come back again and again and again and folks liked it. You know, they were like, no, Rodney can act a little bit. And so they started throwing me in in certain um, certain situations where, you know, I think um, Max would call it, you know, I was sort of like a cleanup hitter, you know, when we couldn't get a scene to work or because of whatever reason, uh, we would rewrite a scene and put that guy in to explain um, 
why. And so when you find me in scenes, it's usually to, you know, connect one storyline to another. You get nervous when you're in front of the camera besides being a writer? No, I've been around the camera for a long time, so it's never really been a thing of um, nerves or anything like that. Yeah, when I saw you, man, I was like, I told my wife, I was like, that, that's that's the guy who wrote Philadelphia. I swear to God. And she's like, what? My wife is like, huh? And you know, my we're we're, we're comic book guys, and our wife like, just what's Philadelphia? Like, what's Philadelphia? What's Philadelphia? I was like, yeah, I know him. And then I looked at, I was like, oh, you wrote and produced it too. I was like, that's awesome, man. So uh, let's segue in us in, man, to uh, to the next one. And uh, let's talk a little bit about Philadelphia, man. One of my favorite reads. Um, so how did this come to be? Are you and are you a big horror guy? Because you yeah. know, go ahead, man. Let, let us talk to us about it. Yeah, I'm um, loved horror my entire life. Um, actually, more than anything else, uh, I was always a horror guy. Grew up with um, the creature Saturday Night Creature Features when I was a kid. Um, always read horror comics. Always read horror novels. Um, Thus, my love of Stephen King and Anne Rice and Richard Matheson and Octavia Butler and so many other incredible folks. And, um, you know, but when I got to Hollywood and I tried to write features or TV shows or I had ideas where um, horror ideas, it just I could never get any traction. So the door opened first to uh, comedy. So I walked in. But it was always with an eye on one day I'm going to get this opportunity to uh to write horror so whether it was uh falcon um you know always or some sitcom or whatever it was i was working on i was always with an eye of one day being able to get into the horror genre and um you know sort of put my little my little thumbprint in there with everybody else's hmm. nice i know when you when people who collect who buy comic books you have to do advanced orders you have to buy them like about two or three months in advance mm -hmm. and i was reading the synopsis of philadelphia when it said vampires ex-presidents i said i'm there <laughs> that's all i had to read i go i am reading this story because i got a feeling it's going to be good i appreciate that thank you did you have this uh did, did, I, I i bet you did but did you have this on your mind for the last 30 years about writing about philadelphia and, had, and dead presidents becoming I, vampires I had pieces of it. Um, yeah, I used to love this show as a kid, Cole Shack the Night Stalker. Um, when I was like seven, eight years old, uh, I used to come on Friday nights, I think, on CBS or ABC. And um, they started off as movies of the week and then eventually yeah. became a series. And uh, Richard Matheson wrote the, uh, the movies of the week. And um, I just fell in love with them. And I said, again, it sort of planted a seed. And then I loved Salem's Lot. Uh, which led me to Bram Stoker's Dracula, and then eventually, um, a little later, the Anne Rice um, Vampire Chronicles and other, you know, stuff, The Delicate Dependency, and a bunch of other great vampire novels. And um, I love the Hammer films, um, the Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing uh, vampire movies, and Frank Langella's version, Bella Lugosi's version, um, but I never really saw people of color, you know, prominently positioned as vampires. And so I always had in the back of my mind, a, uh, it was a fluid idea of what, if I ever did a series or a show about vampires, where it would be. And as I got older and I learned to actually write, like I had a desire before I actually had the knowledge of how to, and still learning as I continue on. It's like, okay, you know, I do this. Okay, here another piece came and another piece came and another piece came. And then eventually all of the pieces came and I'd had a relationship with John, uh, Jason Sean Alexander and um, eventually sold him on the idea and we partnered up and uh, Philadelphia was born. I was uh, rereading Philadelphia and I was uh, rereading episode, I mean, uh, issue number five. And mm -hmm. I noticed you put in Carl Kolchak from the yes. Night Stalker, and I told yes. Ian, oh my God, I grew up watching that show. And yeah. it was like my favorite show. I think it was on ABC and just yeah. that show just used to just put me like on nerves just seeing what would happen next. And I yeah. thought it was so awesome that you put that character into your book. I love Carl. I love Carl Koshak. Great character. I'm writing, I'm actually writing um, a story for his fifth, I've already written it. I think it's already uh, illustrated. Um, for the 50th anniversary of uh, Cole Shack and the comic books for Moonstone that comes wow. out either later this year or the beginning of next year. 
uh, I've written a story for them for uh, Maystar. Yeah, I remember the actor, Darren McGavin. That was a yep. perfect choice for that story. A Christmas story as well, but yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the, the one, the, the one uh, kind of um, arc that I, that I really am connecting with, I think it goes through all four arcs <laughs> that are happening right now, is just the relationship between Jimmy and James. Mm -hmm. Like, tell me more about that relationship, man, because that, you know, James is that old, he, you know, he's that get off my lawn dad, you know, like, uh, yeah. and Jimmy's just like, but I'm, but dad, I want you to watch me be on your lawn, you know, let me yeah. on, you know, like, tell us yeah. more about that, that, cause it's like a, um, it, I always see Philadelphia, like when I read it, it's like, uh, it's, it, it's an arc of power and it's an arc of redemption. There's these mm -hmm. two things that are going on, right? Like, uh, and everybody wants a little bit of both that are going on. So what's going on with Jimmy and James, man? Uh, based on my relationship with my father and uh, my relationship with my son, um, when my father passed away uh, roughly five, six years ago, uh, could be longer because COVID has messed with my sense of time. Um, I remember thinking, you know, the difficult nature of our relationship, if we had had more time, would we be able to have patched things up and, you know, ideas started flooding, you know, I always like the personal nature of genre stories more so than just the genre. Like I think anybody could do a movie that's just about vampires being vampires. I'm more of the introspective um, person. I like those stories a little bit more mm -hmm. uh, where the vampires think and feel and are mm -hmm. sort of shades of um, what they were when they were human beings. And so, it was really more about that, more of a cathartic experience and trying to write to um, two guys who loved each other, wanted to connect, but had this distance between them and how to sort of in this collective um, uh, goal of trying to stop a vampire, even though one of them is a vampire, maybe they could solve some of their problems. Yeah. And, I, and I'm seeing a lot of like uh, when I read it um, and I'm a, I, I do I, I work with people. Mm -hmm. um, and I see a lot of um, that kind of um, hints towards like generational trauma. Like, mm -hmm. um, and this is not, and I'm, and I'm looking at James and Jimmy, and then I see it there with the relationship, but it's going all the way back because this is a, this is a history book. This is a history book about America. And, uh, you know, it talks about slavery and everything. What's your thoughts on that? And have did you did you want to include, uh, like, generational trauma in, in Philadelphia? Yeah, I mean, certainly that idea of history, um, and specifically certain aspects of history that affects our characters. Um, a lot of it is marinated in trauma. And so because they remember and because they still carry a lot of that trauma burden with them, mm -hmm. uh, it manifests itself in current times. And so, yes, it speaks to um, it speaks to that type of generational trauma, but I think it more of an in a personal way than in a macro sense, even though that's certainly part of the larger idea of what Philadelphia is as well. Yeah, and you know, it's in major cities where like a lot of the, you know, tr tr traumatic things happened in the past for slavery and African-Americans, Annapolis, uh, you know, Philadelphia, especially mm -hmm. Baltimore, you know, with, with Nita Halls, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, um, I, uh, I'm glad that, you know, you, we finally get to have that voice, you know, we finally get to have that voice and we get, we get to have that perspective in, in Philadelphia. So thank you. Thank I you. Have two questions about the character, James. First of all, he looks like an actor, Phil Morris, mm -hmm. as everybody told you that. And, um, my second question is, um, the thought James, the, the father, he must have some type of inner strength, but he hasn't turned evil yet. I mean, whenever when somebody turns, when somebody gets bitten, they're like, it seems like they're automatically, they turn to a vampire and they're evil, but he has some kind of inner strength where he's holding all that back and he still has part of his humanity in him. Mm -hmm. I think, um, a big part of that is, um, well, yes, I believe Phil Morris has been model. Jason does on um, this photorealism type art. So he has models come in and sort of set up scenes for him and he, takes pictures of them and draws from that. So I believe Mr. Morris was a part of that um, and maybe still is. I'm not sure. Jason just, I sent him a script and a book comes back. So I don't know um, if he's still doing it. Um, in regards to, uh, what was the second question? Uh, the second um, question where the father, he's, he's, he's turned to a vampire. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
But what I I don't know if it's as much evil as it is they become predators, and mm -hmm. the idea of survival is heightened because now um, you know blood isn't something that's readily available. But I never make a judgment as to whether they're good or evil. Um, I think in regards to James, he's still cognizant that he's around people that he loves, um, primarily his um, his uh, Jose and uh, Jimmy, his son. And fortunately, because they're in the midst of a war, there's enough blood to go around so he doesn't have to go hunting for it like the average vampire does. So, you know, I think it's the predatory nature more so than anything else, more so than evil. The thing that sort of um, plays into the idea of uh, good and evil really has more to do with what their goals are. Like, you know, with John Adams wanting to make America great again, um, that plays in direct opposition to the idea of the America that we have. So people will die and people will um, be hurt in that process. But in his mind, America needs a makeover. So if you're a vampire, this is what you do. I think more, I see it more as logic. You know, it's a logical progression for them to go from where they are and they have perspective and immortality. You know, this is what we have to do. And thanks for announcing her name, Jose. I was wondering how you pronounce that. <laughs> yes, 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 Jose. Is yeah. What I call her. Yeah. <laughs> and one of my favorite characters is Seesaw. So tell us a little, tell, how did yeah. Seesaw come about? I, 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 I love this character. Yeah, Seesaw is sort of the voice of um, the street, the common man. You know, he's the guy who really doesn't have an axe to grind. Um, he's not trying to make up with his father and he's not trying to take over the world. Uh, it's more of, he just wants peace and he's thrown into this thing where he's a part of this play and, uh, never asked to be, and is sort of trying to find his way to some semblance of perspective and so that he can move on and have, um, a good life, even though he's dead, but life. Yeah. And he was, he's a vampire, but he's more like a wizard. Right, like he. Well, he's read a book um, that uh, that uh, certain uh, I think Jefferson had one and uh, Adams had one, and he's read a book, so he's learned the ability to do certain things that defy physics and what we call magic, and so um, he utilizes that at times. Um, so yeah. Besides uh, Mulder, when I was rereading it, I noticed you put in Scully. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Cole, yeah. Scully and Mulder. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I thought that's cool. a, it, Thank you. There's a couple of folks. We used to do that in the beginning. I don't have time as much now, but we do homages from time to time to vampire films. We did one to the Salem's Lot miniseries. Um, and one issue, Vincent Price is in another. Um, every once in a while, we'll stick a character in as an homage, but not make them part of the story so we don't get sued. Yeah, I was wondering about that. You have to ask permission for that? To use you, these do. Characters, right? you yeah. do, you do, you yeah. do. Hmm. And then um, it's been um, it's been optioned, right, by HBO? Um, no, it's been optioned by a company called Levantine. They did okay. Beast of No Nation and Hidden Figures. And um, I was actually working on the pilot script this morning. Oh, awesome. Like. Nice. Um, Man, I, I just I love James, and I I, I hope it's Denzel Washington. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. That would, that would be a huge. I don't. Know, I don't know I if don't, Denzel wants to do TV at this point in his career, but <laughs> if he was willing to, I'd do it. Yeah. Hey, man, uh, Keanu Reeves is doing TV, man. Everybody's coming to TV now, I guess. That's you know? true. So That's yeah. true. It's part of it. But hey, man, I'm I'm looking forward to this be to being uh, part of uh, you know on TV or you know on TV or in a streaming or wherever it is because I know it's gonna be awesome. I hope it's streaming so you have the freedom to do what you want and we can make it. Because when you go gory in this book, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of good good stuff going on. There's a lot of you know relationships. Like I said, it's a power and redemption story. In my eyes, you know, like, you know, everybody wants redemption and everybody wants a little bit of power, but there's a lot of gore too. Mm -hmm. And people are just getting eight heads chopped off and whatever, man. And when it goes gory, like, uh, I know, uh, I know, I know, uh, Alexander, he, he just lets it go. You let him go. You're like, just, just make well, it. Well, it's, to do. it's so, hard in the script when, um, you know, I got to figure out ways to kill people in very unique yeah. ways, you know, ripping off heads and cutting people in half and, you know, knocking one head from one side to the other page and, um, I'm starting to run out of ways to kill people, but I'm still trying. <laughs> yeah. How did you pick the city of Philadelphia? Were there other um, you're thinking of, or just directly? No, I felt, like, I felt like Philadelphia was the perfect model of an idea of what democracy could be 
because of all you know the Liberty Bell and the Declaration of Independence and all of the symbols of、um, democracy that are there, but yet all of the social ills that are there as well, as far as poverty and、um, you know、uh, urban blight, you know homelessness, drug addiction, homicides, you know the. Philadelphia's been pre- being hit pretty hard these days,、yeah. and I just felt like I, I read an article、um, about the Badlands in Philadelphia, where there are areas where the police don't even go that they've sort of given up on, where you have a lot of addicts, and the only time they go in there is to take out dead bodies, and it's sort of like the tent cities that you find here in LA a lot, the homeless,、um, but you know times ten, and I saw a video where they went down the street. And it just showed people laying about anywhere, everywhere. And if I was a vampire,、um, I would look、mm. for a place like that. And you would have an endless food supply,、um, just from the predatory point of view, but also certainly people whose people whose minds would be open to being、uh, susceptible to your message.、Mm-hmm. And you moved from one city to the other. Went from Philadelphia, and I know that.、Um... Nita Hall's nightmare blog is part of the universe of Philadelphia because Nita Hall was the ex-girlfriend to、uh, Jimmy.、Yeah. So let's talk a bit. Of, and you brought that in in issue, I think, be on、it? sale、uh, this week. Yeah,、uh, yeah, issue number seven. Yeah, there you、and、go. Nita Hall.、Oh. She was introduced in,、uh, I believe, episode eighteen of Philadelphia. They、yeah. mentioned her name. I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell us how this how did, how did this come about, Nita Hall's and. How does、um, Nita Hall relate to you? Like, I she seems like a very full character, and she has a lot going for her. You, uh, uh, you know, pretty full, and maybe someone you have you probably known in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think with Nita, it was more of I wanted to do that、um, Kolchak type thing、um, where I dealt with not necessarily a monster of the week, but a case that a journalist had to investigate.、Mm-hmm. And、um, there's a book I read as a kid、uh, called Legion. It's by William Peter Blatty, who is. It was a sequel to The Exorcist, and、um, it dealt with、uh, the Gemini killer, who was actually possessed by the demon that was in Reagan in The Exorcist. And I always was like, if demons do possess people, why don't they just kill people? Why flip on beds and you know scare people when you can、mm-hmm. just you have a human instrument to go and kill people? What's the point? And、um, You know, I like ideas. I like when genre sort of speaks to society, and you can connect it. Like you can go into a normal world that's reflective of the world that we live in, and then you can kind of come out into the supernatural world and keep doing those things. So, much like Philadelphia, where you know you have a cop and he's doing cop things, but you add in a vampire and it sort of changes things.、Um, I wanted to do that with demons.、Um, I wanted to do that with、um, someone who had gone through trauma and her own personal demons, and sort of use the metaphor of being haunted, you know,、um, possessed in a way that a lot of us go through trauma. I think we have a lot of trauma in American society today, and a lot of the、um, atrocities we see are really people hurting and screaming out for help and not finding any. And I wanted to do a book that was sort of empathetic to that idea, and a character that sort of embodied that idea, but had the courage to face that trauma and not necessarily run away from it. I like the covers.、Um, I know they're an homage to a famous artist. I'm drawing a blank on the artist's name. Right, right Saturday Morning Post、um, yes. uh, covers Jason.、Yeah. Uh, we had. A, I asked him if he could do one a long time ago. That's that first one where she's looking at the cell phone and the demons are coming out of the cell phone.、Um, and he just went wild with it, and it was beautiful. And he's done them ever since. You think there'll ever be a crossover between Philadelphia and Nita Haas? The- Oh, I can't give that away. No, I can't give that away.、Come、I had to ask. Yeah, I can't give it away. But、um, they, they exist in the same world, so anything's、yeah. possible. Yeah, I love I love Howlin' Henry, man. I'm a big blues fan, and I see、yeah. Howlin' Henry and a lot of、uh, my favorite blues guys. Like I was a, I've always been a Robert Johnson fan. I mean, anybody that plays the blues knows the blues. Your your、mm-hmm. basis is always Mr. Johnson, right? Like,、um, and the、yeah. Crossroads and. The Mississippi Delta Blues, like, how does that play into、uh, this story? Because, you know, I, I know if you're not into blues and you don't know about the Mississippi Delta Blues and how much that means to America, right? Like, and it, was that important for you to get that up in there? 
Yeah, I mean, to me, I'm always looking for different places to tell stories from. Um, a lot of times when you're dealing with, in quotes, the hood, um, mm -hmm. the stories are kind of, they have a sameness to them. Mm -hmm. You know, you either have poverty and you have people um, behaving, the gang members or it's different things that, you know, the same four or five things. And I was like, how can I take something from the past that you really don't hear a lot about which would be a blues singer and who has been wronged and now has been given the opportunity to get revenge. And um, that's what I'm, I'm always looking for stuff like that, periods like that. You know, a lot of stuff in Philadelphia go through different periods in time, whether it's post-Civil War, slavery, uh, World War II. Uh, I'm always looking for different periods of history to tell stories because typically we get the same periods all the time, the same types of characters. So mm -hmm. I felt like Howling Henry could, you know, tell a story that not a lot, we don't see a lot of. I think it's important that you put Howling Henry in there and that we talk about Robert Johnson. Now, kids that are watching this interview are going to be like looking up Robert Johnson now, you know, like yeah, um, so. and what and what he means to uh, America in general. Like uh, mm -hmm. all the great blues, blues players come from him, you know, from Eric Clapton to Jimi Hendrix to uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Keith Richards, man. They're all, they're all the bases of how they play. Is the way Robert Johnson play on them, whatever it was, man, on that 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 uh, that recording that you could barely hear that you put your ears to to try to catch the chords to try to catch, you know, whatever he was playing, man. And I think that was uh, really represented well in Howlin', Howlin Henry. Thank you. And it was a uh, it was in An An Annapolis, and that's that's yeah Annapolis, yeah. It was in yeah, where I'm from. Right. Yeah, I do a lot of uh, Annapolis, Baltimore. You know, I try to get my hometown in there. Same way with Stephen King and Bangor, Maine. I try to get my hometown yeah. in there too. Nice. And I and I think it's important because you know, like we don't hear about stories coming from there, from Baltimore and you know, and, and Maryland as much as we should. You know, like uh, and you're giving that, you're giving that 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 piece of America, you know, some love as well. Try doing my best. How do you get a, uh, like say when you started writing Philadelphia, did you pitch it to only Image or did you go to other publishers? Uh, I think we went to Vertigo uh, at the time, but Vertigo was near the end of Vertigo and they didn't really get it. And then we went to Image because Jason had a relationship with, um, he had been drawn Spawn. So mm -hmm. he had a relationship with Image. Nice. Nice. Are we going to see you work on some Spawn, man? I mean, you, you know? If they, if, if someone send me, usually what happens is someone sends an email and they ask me and, you know, if it's something I can work into the schedule, I say yes. I mean, that, I mean, that uh, Todd was at Image, the Image booth, you know, at San Diego Comic-Con. Did you guys, were you guys able to, no? He had Jason with him. Yeah, he had Jason with him. Jason could always ask on my behalf. Jason is... You know, we're kind of sewn at the hip. So anything Jason asks, I usually adhere to. So there you go. yeah, we would love to hear that. So what's so what's what's moving forward? What's going on with Nita? Because I f I finished the first volume. Mm -hmm. I finished the first volume. What are we moving on towards with Nita? Oh, this is, is like next? I said. This is uh this is the one that drops this week. Um, exactly. Issue seven um, comes out this week. So awesome. a new so adventure, a new thing. Make sure yeah. to pick it up, guys, man. It's, it's a great book. It's a great yeah. read. A lot of good stuff. Very, I mean, Efren can speak on it. He he, he talks, to, talks to me about it all the time. Well, I've done two, uh, I do like two books of the uh, reads of the week. I've done mm -hmm. two reads of the week on my Instagram page. And one has been Philadelphia, and the other one has been Nita Hobbs. I haven't done any since then. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I appreciate that. I appreciate these it. books, I mean, they just caught my interest. When I was growing up, I was Marvel, like 99% mm -hmm. of the time, a little bit of DC. I, if I've gotten older, my tastes have changed. And I love indie books now more than ever. So like I said, mm -hmm. when I seen Philadelphia on the advanced orders, I said, um, I, I just got to read this book, you know? Then, right. then Nita Haas, I went, oh my God, the artwork, the cover, you know, the covers do mm -hmm. grab my attention first. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, I learned, oh my God, Rodney uh, wrote this also. I go, then I told Ian about it. I go, you got to read this, <laughs> you know? One last question. Mm -hmm. I, I always see you post these right here mm -hmm. on your Instagram. And I, I'm, <laughs> I'm very interested in these, man, because every time I see you eating dinner with this green, you know, uh, you know, green vinyl seat in the back, it's always with someone famous, man, like... Tell me more about this place, and is this a place to be, a place to eat, Mr. Barnes? Uh, Delmonico's Lobster and Steakhouse in Encino, California. Um, 
on the corner of Havenhurst and Ventura Boulevard. I think it's 16358 Ventura Boulevard. Um, they were gracious enough about a decade ago to give me a booth there. That gold plaque that you see in the back has my name on it. Wow. Says, this table is reserved for Rodney Barnes. And I started to have meetings there. And um, one day I took a picture. Someone said, can we take a picture in this booth? I love this booth. And I took a picture there and I posted it. And then another person asked and another person. And I just started doing it. And then eventually people started calling me saying, hey, can I have lunch in that booth with you? And I was like, sure. And then here you go. I just have lunch with folks and talk about whatever we're there to talk about. Is this where, is this is this like where the deals go down at this booth? Like uh, um, you guys talking about like these I, stories and the movies and the comic books? Philadelphia books? was born there. Uh, wow. Jason and I were having dinner and um, it's the first time he said yes to any idea I had. Um, there are times when, you know, uh, creative conversations that lead to other things uh, happen there. And um, there you go. Is Breaking, right. bed, breaking Bread important in, in, in Hollywood? And, um, in I think anytime you can develop a personal relationship with um, your fellow creators, it always makes for a more relaxed. Anytime you can communicate with folks. You can take away the anxiety that comes with uh, the unfamiliar. Um, it always makes things better. I have one more question too. I hope yes. to see more. I hope to see more historical figures in Catalfia. Every time somebody pops in, I can. I can tell you that. I can tell you well. I can tell you well. They usually, I figure, what they're doing is more important than them. Like, I don't want to just use somebody for the sake of using. I've seen people do that before. Sure. Like, you know, if they can, uh, I won't say any names, but there are people who will take the name of a historical figure and just throw them into something. It's like in Philadelphia, they have to serve a purpose. You know, all of them, all whether it's Sally Hemings or George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or any of those folks, um, sometimes people that are off to the side, like Toussaint, who's the vampire hunter, um, I try to find people who actually the idea of them in history is connected to um, something in Philadelphia that's needed. Nice. And I, I have one more question for you. Yeah. You know, like we have, we have great. We there's a very big presence of African American writers and and um, and directors. Now we have Ryan Coogler from my hometown in Oakland. We got Jordan Peele doing his thing. We got Tyler Perry. We got Misha Green who did Lovecraft. Um, country like is this the opportunity that we're we're gonna see like some great great horror films from the african-american from the black perspective are we is this is this it is this gonna be a moment in time we're gonna see this well i'll answer that two ways um probably from the beginning of uh you've had um writers of color who were capable mm -hmm. of making incredible television and film the issue is always the gatekeepers that sort of um, uh, give the green light or not, you know, and some have been able to sneak through and others haven't. I will say that what you have now that's a little different is you have the ability now, more so than any other time that I can think of in history, to make your own stuff. Like the tools are readily available. If you want to do a Blair Witch Project with your cell phone, you could go out right now and shoot a movie on your cell phone. You know, for nothing. If you and your friends have, you know, some ability and skill and, and wherewithal that you can get it done now, whereas, you know, things like film and television require money. And they're usually people that um, don't have money. It's difficult for them to make, to have the equipment and all of those things. But I think today's world, you have a better shot than any other time that I can think of ever. That's why you see so much really dope stuff coming out. Yeah, it's awesome, man. I mean, I grew up with Spike Lee movies. He's one of my favorite directors of all time. Really gave me a real big perspective on life, you know, would do the right thing, you know, like, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad to see it back, man. I'm glad to see it back. Uh, but hey, um, let's talk about this, man. Where can people find you, Mr. Barnes? And we want to thank you again. You're very welcome again. Um, at the Rodney Barnes on Twitter and Instagram, primarily. And I'm on Facebook. I don't know my address. I just know that there's a guy that looks like me in my picture. <laughs> If you can find a guy that looks like me, it's probably me. Um, RodneyBarnes.com, um, ZombieLoveStudios.com, uh, the websites, and um, there you go. That's where you can find me. 
Hey, Mr. Barnes, we want to thank you again, me and Efren. Um, it's been thank a you. delight to have you on. I've yeah, been wanting you. to interview for, I've been wanting to interview for the last like three years since I've been on this been podcasting. So I finally was able to do it and I know uh Efren. Efren, yeah. Efren enjoyed your stuff too, you know. Yep. I appreciate both you guys and your interests and kind words about my work and um, I really, really appreciate it and I'll try to keep it up. I right, keep doing what you're doing, Mr. Barnes. We thank you again. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank, thank you, you, brothers. Take it easy. Have a great Sunday.